remarkable opportunities of my life earlier this year uh, on a trip to Greece I took with Ralston College, it's a university, new university that I'm associated with in Savannah, Georgia. We went to Samos with the first class for Ralston College, but while I was there, I had the opportunity, or the opportunity was provided to me, to go to Turkey, to the ancient town, the ancient city of Ephesus. There's an old library there, which rivaled the Library of Alexandria in the ancient world, so one of the world's first repositories of academic knowledge. And Ephesus has been excavated. It's quite a remarkable archeological excavation, like, like the city of Pompeii, a huge city, Greek city, thousands of years old, 4,000 years old or more, all excavated. From the Greek perspective, um, the Turkish authorities were extremely helpful. They lit up the whole city for us at night. I was able to give this lecture to the students at Ralston College and then publicly to all of you in front of this ancient building, this ancient library, all lit up with beautiful LEDs. It was one of the most spectacular things I'd ever seen. And to be on the grounds of this ancient place to give this lecture was quite the damn thrill, I can tell you that. And so, you know, Western society really derived from two sources in some real sense, two fundamental sources. I suppose you could add Rome as a third, but there's a Greek stream and a Judeo-Christian stream, and they both developed the idea of the logos, and logos is the root word of logic. And so, forget about the Judeo-Christian logos for a minute. On the Greek side, there was this deep idea developed by Greek philosophers that the world had an intrinsic order, that at the bottom of, of reality itself, especially on the objective front, the more objective front, there was a palpable, discernible, and benevolent order that would make itself accessible to the imagination and intellectual inquiry of human beings so that we, the cosmos was comprehensible, right? That's a, that's a great Greek proposition. And, and that's the proposition of this intrinsic logos. Now, on top of that was laid the Judeo-Christian idea of the logos, which, which was something like the notion that the divine element of the human being was that of courageous, exploratory, communicator. That's the Logos idea. And so you can see out of the combination of those two ideas that something like science could emerge because you'd have the notion that the universe was intelligible in its fundamental structure. That's the intrinsic Logos of reality. And then that the human being's Logos could interact with that and produce intelligible order. And so anyways, I got to talk about the Greek idea of the Logos insofar as I understand it at the foot of at the steps of the Ephesus Library in this absolutely beautiful um, in locale, and I'd invite you all to to listen to the lecture and and to enjoy it with any luck and to find it useful and engaging. It certainly was a great privilege for me to do this. It was definitely one of the highlights of my life. So, welcome to that. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be here on the steps of the Library of Celsus, here in the ancient Greek city of Ephesus. It was here that Heraclitus first articulated the idea of the Logos as the principle and structure underlying reality itself. It was here that the Apostle John lived and died. In the beginning was the Word. And so it is appropriate that Ralston College should come here as we seek to revive and reinvent the university, as we seek to revive our understanding of ourselves and of the world. You might think about the Logos, it's worthwhile and useful to think about the Logos as something like the intrinsic order of the cosmos. Of course, that begs the question in some sense, well, a number of questions, what do you mean by intrinsic? What do you mean by order? What do you mean by cosmos? And you can break the cosmos down to begin with in something into, 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 into two subcategories, macrocosmic and microcosmic. And uh, you can think about the microcosm and the macrocosm in a purely objective sense. You can think about the microcosm as the hidden world beneath the resolution of our vision. So, of course, 
There's an unbelievably active world of hidden complexity at work at levels of resolution much higher than we can see, moving all the way down to the quantum realm. And as scientists, we've been very good at elucidating the nature of that microcosm. And then you could think of the macrocosm as the external world that extends up above us into the objective cosmos itself. But there's another way of thinking about that that brings the psychological on board, and, and that is that the microcosm is, in some sense, the objective material world that beckons at higher levels of resolution. But the macrocosm is something more conceptual and psychological rather than something objective and external. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind as we, um, as we move forward through this exercise in thought. Another way of thinking about this so we can hit the underlying conceptual target from a multitude of different dimensions, you could, you could also think that we're beset by two mysteries in some sense. We have the world of what matters and the degree to which the world of what matters is the most real is indeterminate because it depends on how you define reality. If you define reality as that which exists in the objective world, then the world of what matters is not fundamental. But it's my observation that we act as if the world of what matters is more real than the world of matter. And I think in some sense, the most compelling evidence for that, even to a skeptic, and it's a pessimistic form of evidence, but it suffices sometimes pessimistic evidence is the most potent. The reality of pain is undeniable and it's not amenable to rational argumentation. It announces its existence. And for a long time, I think I thought in some real sense that there was no more fundamental reality than pain. And there's an ethical dimension to that too, because if you accept the reality of pain, there seems to come with it an impetus to eliminate unnecessary pain. And to some degree, we can understand that as the basis of the moral impulse and maybe to eliminate the unnecessary pain of, of the innocent, like the unnecessary pain of children, for example. And so, well, we accept the existence of pain as something so real that we will almost instantaneously act on it. And I would say that's especially the case in the case, say, of infants. And so it isn't obvious what's real because it depends in some sense on how you define the term. But my sense is that what people believe is most accurately reflected, not in what they say or in the propositions about the world they lay out, but in how they act. And so, and that's also something subject to debate, but it's not a shallow argument to say that your belief is most deeply reflected in your action. In fact, I think in some sense, it's the deepest of arguments. And you know perfectly well that you can say one thing and do another, and you also know that you regard people who do that as hypocrites, and you tend to regard what they do as a more profound pointer to what they believe than what they say. And so you'll call them on that too. And so that means that there are some meanings that we regard as inviolably real. Now, the reason I concentrated on pain is because it's pretty easy to destroy joy. You can do that with a rational critique, and we're quite good at that. And you can destroy faith, and you can destroy hope, and you can destroy enthusiasm, and you can often do that even with a casual word.